We've come to Discovery World on Milwaukee's Lake Michigan Lakefront, and behind me is the world's largest interactive model of the Great Lakes. This display can simulate Great Lakes weather, including rain, fog, and even thunderstorms. In just a few minutes, we'll set sail on Lake Michigan on Wisconsin's flagship, the Dennis Sullivan. And then we'll begin a two-part series on Lake Michigan shipwrecks. But first, I'll take you fishing for northern pike and bass on the Brule River in Florence County. I'm Dan Small, and it's time once again for Outdoor Wisconsin. Summer to fall, winter to spring, from Green Bay to where the same, Croy sings from Catamaran to Superior Shore. Outdoor Wisconsin, Outdoor Wisconsin. This is the Lake Michigan tank here in the Ryman Aquarium, and we're on the lower level at Discovery World. You know, this aquarium contains 200,000 gallons of water. Let's see it, 8.35 pounds per gallon. That's 1,670,000 pounds, or 835 tons of water. With all that weight, it makes good sense to put it on the lower level. These fish are native to the Great Lakes, and many of them can be found in Great Lakes tributaries as well. Last fall, I joined guide Clint Burns to fish a tributary of a tributary of Lake Michigan, the Border Brule River in Florence County. This first section we're going to fish is not super deep, mm -hmm. um, but it is river channel. Uh -huh. So okay. um, letting her drop down about a foot, foot uh -huh. and a half is going to okay. be great. All right. Just a slow strip back will work real well. Yep. I'm on the Brule River in Florence County on the Wisconsin-Michigan border today with guide Clint Burns of Classic Cast Outfitters. And Clint, uh, you're a man uh, after my own heart. We're both fly fishermen. Flying is great. Yeah, and we're after toothy critters today. Yes, we are. Northern pike and muskie. All right. Yep. Uh, uh, what have you got there for a fly? I'm throwing a bead head okay. with a big old furry rabbit body. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, hopefully it's going to turn some attention. Okay. A <clears throat> little bit weighted on the bow, keeps the head down, uh -huh. makes right. it swim. This is uh, Enrico Puglisi uh, saltwater, and uh, they call it pike and saltwater. It looks like a perch. So it and looks like a perch. Yeah. It's Perfect almost, pattern. Yeah. So what's the strategy here? We're going to be casting towards weed edges and pulling it back across the current. Just slow motion. Water temperature's been dropping pretty good lately. Mm -hmm. We're hanging in the upper 50s right now. Okay. And... Uh, it was 70 about a week and a half ago. Yeah. So it's been dropping pretty quick. But that's what we're looking for is stick around the current. It's keeping the forage moving through. Then we'll show them some fake forage. All right. Hopefully well, let's it'll see, work. Let's see if we can get one. All righty. Well, Clint, this looks like dark water. It is a bit dark. It's actually lightened up in the last week. It was pretty dark before. A lot of stained swamp water coming in. And the fish here are resident? They don't, uh, they're do not coming from somewhere or do they live here? They stay here all year. Uh -huh. I've been guiding about 16 years up here. And uh, we pretty much go after everything. Trout is one of my favorites. I love it when people want to go fly fishing for trout. We do a lot of walleye. And uh, last couple of years, I've been having a lot of people wanting to go after northern pike. And are there good pike in here? There are some real good ones in here. I've, I've had a couple that are pushing 45. And uh, some muskies in here that are real nice. There's one. There's a fish. Oh, it's a bass. Nice small oh. one. Looks like. Come on, baby. Ooh, That's a good, good one, one there, one. Dan. Woo -hoo. <laughs> yes. There you go. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> On the perch, there you go. Yes. Well. That's a dandy. Hey, not what we're after, but we'll take them. That's a beautiful smallmouth. <laughs> Got some nice fish in here. Some beautiful fish in here. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's put that baby back and especially this time of year when you don't find fish like that normally. Is that right? <laughs> you don't find smallmouth like yeah. that often. 
All right, go back and send those pike. All right, well, we are on the board and uh, hopefully get another fish or two before the rain chases us <laughs> off the water. There's a fish. That one? Yeah. All right, what do you got? I think it's a northern. That's a nice pike. Yeah, not too bad. Yeah. Well, there's two species. We'll put them back and absolutely let them have another day. Now, what's the forage in this river? You got suckers in here, a lot of perch, bluegills, and of course, walleye. Pretty bass. That's the third species there now. They are. are there a lot of largemouths in here? Not a lot, but this is one of the smaller ones. Uh -huh. Normally they're 18 to 20 inches. Oh, nice fish. Might have a musky on there. I think it's another bass, I can't tell. No, it's a, no, no, it's it's a, a northern. It's a pike. Okay. There we go. All right. There you go. Well, Cliff, not the biggest pike, but uh, we got a couple of nice ones today. There you go. That's a good one. Well, we'll have to come back and see if we can catch some bigger Bye. ones. Okay. They're in here. All right. They're sure in here. We had to cut that trip short when thunder began to accompany the rain. You don't want to be holding a graphite fishing rod in an electrical storm. We'll tell you how to learn more about fishing the brule later in the show. Right now, we've come out to the Dennis Sullivan Dock here at Discovery World. The Dennis Sullivan is the world's only recreation of a 19th century three-masted Great Lakes schooner. It's not here now because it spends the winter in a quiet stretch of the Menominee River. The Dennis Sullivan sailing season runs from May to October, and last summer, Elizabeth Kramer took our crew aboard for an outing and learned about the ship from its captain. Every three years, a special event sails into the largest resource of fresh water in the United States. Tall ships, rising high above the horizon, come together for a parade of sails. Today I join the crew of Milwaukee's Dennis Sullivan to learn about the mission, the ship, and the importance of the great lake that we call Michigan. My name's Tiffany, I'm the captain of Dennis Sullivan. We're gonna get ready for the parade to sail. I will announce our departure from the dock with a ship's horn. I am not gonna lie, it's my favorite thing about every single sail. It is really loud. Come on, let's go set some sail! <laughs> On your peak and throw it, hold away! From the water to the top of the main mast is 96 feet. I've been sailing since I was a little kid, since 10 years old, and boating quite literally my whole life. My grandfather, he always had boats as we were growing up, and he always took us grandkids with him, whether it was just out day fishing or taking us on his cabin cruiser for long, long weekends or week-long trips throughout the Great Lakes. And, Growing up, that honestly is some of my favorite memories. It was either camping with my folks or going boating with my grandfather. And that's when the bug got me, that I just loved every minute of being on his boat. Now the halyard. I'm the senior captain and now director of marine operations for Discovery World. And so not only do I captain the vessel on a fairly regular basis, um, but I also manage all aspects of the ship now, uh, hiring the crew, budgets, the website, for the boat, the social media, um, managing the maintenance of the vessel. That's well, Halyard. I had no idea I could do this for a living. Never was on my radar, literally. I had no idea. I, I did want to work on a vessel, I knew that. I thought more of as a science tech person, not necessarily in command. Um, but when I got to meet the Sullivan the first time, when she on her maiden voyage, uh, on her way out in 2000, 
and I learned about the mission of environmental science biology on a vessel that sails. Her mission is all about the Great Lakes sustainability and all the issues that threaten the Great Lakes is what we're teaching people for the most part. This is one of the biggest bodies of fresh water. It's a huge commodity for the whole Midwest, not just in moving uh, materials, which is it's great for doing on these large ships, but it's also a great recreational area. It's a great resource both in commerce. Our fresh water for our nation is kind of stored right here, a large percentage of it and there probably be a time when more and more states are going to try and tap into this freshwater resource and so we really do have to protect it both from a usage standpoint and then any environmental concerns. We were also teaching oceanography, marine biology, so those were some of my hard studies that I did in college. So it was just a perfect marriage of the environment, the things I was already passionate about, and then the, the the hobby at the time that was something I really enjoyed doing, so bringing them all together. America's Great Lakes, Superior, Michigan, Huron, Erie, and Ontario became the famous setting for tall ship routes in the late 1700s. At the time, these traditionally rigged sailing vessels towered up to 100 feet and were known for carrying long distance cargo as well as fighting battles at sea. Today, they educate and mesmerize crowds as they take sail through harbors like our very own in Kenosha, Wisconsin. This is how everything got through the Great Lakes. All of your bulk cargo and all the development of the Great Lakes, specifically because of ships like the Dennis Sullivan, they moved the cargo through the Great Lakes. And so we owe a lot of gratitude to uh, this style of ship because it moved all of our building supplies that made the Midwest. What is teaching sailing like for you? It's my favorite part. It's why I do this year after year after year. Watching a young person get on board with one kind of uh, con conception of what the experience is going to be and the person that they are, and then the actual experience that they have. As able, reset, main gaff top, mizzen gaff top. During the watches, you had to do a boat check on like air temperature, water temperature, the depth you know, the wind speed and the waves, and you had to write that all down during your watch. The stars, it was amazing, and I saw three shooting stars. It was actually really nice. We've seen some really beautiful sunsets, sunrises, moonrises, moonsets. Uh, the last few nights have been just absolutely stunning with the stars. You learn a lot of self-confidence and teamwork, and another big takeaway, especially in this modern world of technology, a little bit more about community as a whole, you know, you unplug and learn to communicate and be team and learn and become friends with your shipmates. Everybody has to do their part and it's really like interconnected, a lot more interconnected on the ship than people are on land. For me, that's the thing that I'm, that's why I'm still here is the teaching of the sailing. It was definitely really different but really fun and enjoyable. Prepare to fire! Just the awe of a ship like this really helps capture the imagination of people. You know, we're keeping history alive by the way we sail this vessel. Fire! Fire! On your throat, he's away. He's away. He's away. The way we sail this vessel is the same techniques they used 150 years ago. It's just materials are modern. That's the only difference. But instead of having canvas sails, we have synthetic canvas sails that are made out of, a, a, you know, a plastic that will hold up longer than a canvas. What is your advice to anyone who is maybe curious about sailing but doesn't know how to swim or is afraid of the water? Yeah, you don't have to know how to swim. In fact, um, you know, back in the day, sailors didn't know how to swim at all. Uh, I mean, a lot of people know how to swim now. But, you know, the idea is to stay on the boat. You know, my job as captain, if you want to define it, is to keep the water out and the people in. The way to get started in something like this is to volunteer either at a sailing center if you're curious just about sailing or if um, you want to get into a tall ship. There's probably a tall ship not too far away that you can actually volunteer on and get your feet wet. In most programs such as the Dennis Sullivan, we take volunteers for a week and we'll teach you everything you need to know. You don't need to know anything. You just have to have the right attitude because it is close communal living. It's long days. We usually work 12 hours a day six days a week so you know you have to have that mindset that you're there to work not just to be on a boat and having fun. As the tall ships sailed into the Lake Michigan Harbor we're reminded of the words from the famous poet John Macefield. I must go down to the seas again to the lonely sea in the sky 
and all I ask is a tall ship and a star to steer her by. I'm on the deck of a replica of the Challenge, a ship built in Manitowoc in 1852 by William Wallace Bates, who was only 25 at the time and had no more than an eighth grade education. He did come from a family of shipbuilders, though, so he knew what he was doing. This 85% scale replica of the original challenge was built in 2006 by a team of 16 volunteers led by master shipwright Rob Stevens, who also helped build the Dennis Sullivan. The challenge's last voyage was in 1910 when it got caught in some pound nets and its crew was forced to beach it south of Sheboygan. In part one of a two-part series on Lake Michigan shipwrecks, We'll learn about Wisconsin's maritime history as producer Tracy Newman takes us underwater to explore some vessels that never made it back to port. Milwaukee was settled by water and built on water. I mean, there was a reason. At one point, we had more grain silos and moved more grain through Milwaukee than Chicago did. The lakes used to be like the freeway, if you can imagine. Many, many ships. The schooners were the semi-trailers of the day. As a historian, you look back on why Milwaukee is Milwaukee and the Great Lakes have so much to do with it. Lake Michigan is a bear when it comes out of the Northeast. You better get out of there. There are more than 750 shipwrecks in Wisconsin waters. There are new discoveries made every day. You go down the line and all of a sudden that wreck appears. And it's like, wow. These are time capsules. It's a moment frozen in time when they go to the bottom. Out of the 19 men, nine were killed, 10 were saved, and two were never found. We're trying to understand the characteristics of how the water is changing. So we're trying to understand better what is going to happen with the shipwreck. The lake lives. You get the sense that this is a massive body of water that is fame of song and story. Two guys that never were found are in there. They have to be. Well, shipping was on the Great Lakes was really the way we were founded. Buffalo to Milwaukee was an immigration path. Prior to the railroads in Chicago, um, Milwaukee was actually larger than Chicago and was really an immigration disembarkment point. And then, even after the railroads hit Chicago, it was the trade and the commerce using water as the, 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 as the interstate highway system. The lumber from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan going to Chicago, um, especially after the Great Fire to rebuild the city, was huge. And there's a lot of that kind of commerce going on in the Great Lakes. Water was the trade lane well into the, the, the 20th century on the Great Lakes. Once the interstate highway system developed and the railroads expanded a little wider into the Midwest region, the reliance on water diminished a bit. But really, it was the waterways and the shipping industry that built up and settled this, this region of the country using the Great Lakes. We still are a global trading port. We still trade all over the world by, by water and maritime as well as within the Great Lakes. You can take the open water diver to here, but you can also take the guy who does 300 foot dives yep. on a regular basis and they're gonna love this wreck. Yeah. Because yep. it's a really good one. It starts at 55 feet. You know, you, you jump into water, you go down and there it is, right there.
The Prince Willem is uh, one of the most dived shipwrecks around Milwaukee for a number of reasons. It's intact still. And also it's accessible to most people because the wreck starts at about 55 feet. We are very lucky in the Great Lakes because the water is fresh and cold. On the bottom, it's usually always 40 degrees. It doesn't change. So the shipwrecks are preserved. And they don't deteriorate, they don't fall apart in, like, in, like in the ocean. Prince Willem V was a regular visitor to Milwaukee. It was on its third of what was going to be another four voyages in 1954 um, when it left Milwaukee um, late in the afternoon. And as it headed out a, a mile and a half or so outside of the Milwaukee breakwater, it collided with a fuel barge. It was carrying fuel oil. This fuel barge actually punctured like a 20-foot gash in the side of the Prince Willem, and it sank. But before it did go down, the, the Coast Guard cut a hollyhock from Milwaukee, came out and, and made sure everyone was rescued. So there were no casualties during the, uh, the loss. What's really interesting about the Prince Willem, historically, was that it was actually built in um, 1939 near Rotterdam. And it was actually in the process in, during World War II of being converted into a, a, a vessel by the German Navy. And in 1944, as Rotterdam was under assault, on D-Day assault, the Germans actually sank it near Rotterdam to kind of slow the oncoming Allied forces. And it, was, it, it stayed there until like 1947 when it was raised, cleaned up, rebuilt, and put into service and trade ultimately with the Great Lakes becoming its, its trading route. Ready? I'm a captain and I take scuba divers out on the Great Lakes to shipwrecks that have been here for hundreds of years. The reason I started diving is because I got really interested in the history of the shipwrecks and the stories behind the shipwrecks. I wanted to know more, I wanted to go see them, what's left of them. As divers we get trained properly and if you follow the proper protocol, it's a very safe sport. If you get ahead of yourself and do something that's not safe, then you can end up staying on the bottom forever. The Willie has lost few divers, unfortunately. Some of them ventured inside and didn't find their way out and perished inside of the wreck. My advice would be get out, get certified, get experience, find buddies you can trust, you can dive with, and just have fun. These are time capsules. When you go down there and you see these wrecks, because it's, it's a moment frozen in time when they go to the bottom. It's the only place you can see them. It, there's no museums that have all these old wooden schooners. Or, and there's schooners that went down in the 1800s that looked like the day they went down. Sometimes suddenly it'll hit you that, oh my goodness, all these people died on this wreck. Um, you're, you're very, you get somber a little bit about it, and you, you deal with respect. We have a law in, in the Great Lakes, you cannot take artifacts off of ships. So a lot of the ships still have artifacts on them. People from the East Coast, West Coast, from the ocean, they take things off of ships, so then there's nothing to see. On these ships, you can go and see still some china, you can see the wheels, you bells on some of them, masts standing upright. If they could raise them, they tried to raise them because they want to reuse them and sail them again. 
Prince William, they wanted to raise it, they tried to raise it, and it was just proved too difficult to do it. In some cases, it's incredibly expensive, and in other cases, sometimes in, in raising them, you disturb them, and they are filled in some cases with a lot of fuel oil. In some cases, it's more of a tomb situation. Let's keep it entombed and encased. We'll wrap up this week's show in the City of Freshwater exhibit, which explains how water travels from Lake Michigan to Milwaukee area homes and back again. There's even a display of Milwaukee's deep tunnel project that helps reduce wastewater runoff to Lake Michigan. It's really cool. To learn more about Discovery World and this week's other features, log on to milwaukeepbs.org and search local programs for outdoor Wisconsin, or visit the Milwaukee PBS Facebook page. I'll be at the Milwaukee Muskie Expo February 14th through 16th at Washington County Fair Park. Stop by our booth and say hello. Well, next time we'll conclude our series on Lake Michigan shipwrecks as we explore two more sunken vessels and talk with a survivor of one of them. And Elizabeth Kramer attends a National Wild Turkey Federation Women in the Outdoors program in Vernon County. Saying goodbye from the City of Freshwater exhibit here at Discovery World, I'm Dan Small. Join us again next week for Outdoor Wisconsin. <laughs>